From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vonnie. Oh, yes? Please, come out here to the house, right away. There's something wrong? Johnny, I... You said you came back here to South Bend to... Well, because you didn't want me to have to be alone to face the death of my father. Yes, dear, I... Johnny, you also said you have business here. Well, yes. Is it... Is it connected with my father's death? Vonnie... Please, dear, don't lie to me. He was insured for over a million dollars. Or do you know that? I... Listen... Was this business of yours connected with Daddy? Was it because you, too, think he was murdered? Johnny? I'll... I'll come out and see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. The question, was it murder? The beautiful girl, Fanny Lamar, and the beautiful romance I found during my so-called vacation at La Jolla, California. Well, things really got into a bind when she received news that her foster father, back in South Bend, Indiana, had suddenly died. And I received word that I was assigned to the case... Not only because of the million and a half policy on Lamar's life, but because it looked as though it might be nothing more nor less than murder. From La Jolla, California to South Bend, Indiana, was only a quick flight by plane. And the first person I contacted was Lawrence Comstock of Trimutual, Chicago office, who'd issued the policies on Lamar's life. Yes, Johnny, the only two real friends Thomas Lamar had these past few years since his wife died were Dr. Ed Wilson and myself. And Wilson is the man you called in when Lamar died. Yes, you see, Tom and I used to spend a lot of time together. Weekend golf, belong to the same clubs, that sort of thing. We used to love playing two-handed pinochle together. Uh Uh-huh. Go on. I was with him at his house the night he died. And so unexpectedly, Johnny, as I told you, he'd had a most thorough physical examination only a few months before. Or I'd never have permitted him to increase his insurance to a million and a half. Must have cost him a fancy premium. It did. It did. Prohibitive. But that was the way he wanted it. For his adopted daughter. For Vani. Whom you know. And if you're half a man, having spent a few days with her in La Jolla, you're in love. Oh, shut up and tell me what you know, will you? You said murder. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Johnny. It began last weekend. As I often do, I spent the weekend with Tom. Thomas Lamar. Well, Friday night, Dr. Ed Wilson was with us. We played three-handed pinochle. Yes, yes. Tom was in perfect health. I know he was. And our evening was all fun, completely uninterrupted. Except by young Marson. Marson? Tom's confidential secretary. And he's the one. Larry, you are the one who told Pat McCracken back in Hartford that you thought Thomas Lamar was murdered. That's why you wanted me to come on out here to investigate the case. Yes, All right, now tell me the truth. Is it because of your great friendship for Lamar? Because of the million and a half policy through your company? Or because you really think he was murdered? Are you here because of the commission you can earn on a case as big as this? Or because Thomas Lamar happened to be the father of Vonnie Lamar? I was ordered on this case from Hartford. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, maybe I'm a silly old fuddy-duddy. Maybe I'm more worked up over this case than you are, whatever the reason. But let me tell you this thing in my own way. Go on, Larry. Well, we know, Ed Wilson and I, I because of being so close to Tom Lamar so long, Ed because of his medical knowledge, we know that Tom was in perfect health. His 59 years were nothing for a specimen like him. Ed left Friday night. I stayed on. Saturday, we played nine holes golf... Tom wanted to play 18, but I didn't feel up to it. And that night, we played Pinochle, just the two of us. And we got to bed early. Well, Sunday, we just sat around and talked until evening when we played cards again. 
There was no strain, Johnny, even if the man had had a bad heart or something. I understand. Now, what about this Marson you named? We quit shortly before midnight. I was tired, my years, no doubt. And I knew Tom would have a hard day at the plant on Monday. And so I suggested we get to bed. He smiled, uh, <laughs> as only Tom could smile. A warm, tolerant, yet at the same time understanding and friendly, completely friendly smile. Go on, go on. And he said he'd probably have to take one of Ed Wilson's sleeping pills to doze off so early. <laughs> but I knew, Johnny. You knew what? Sugar pills. That's all Ed had ever given him. Sugar pills. I think Tom knew it, too. Well? I went up to my room, Tom to his. I heard the water running in his bathroom. About the same time, I was brushing my teeth. And then the crash. Crash? Yes. I ran out through the hall to his room. He was lying on the floor of the bath, broken tumbler beside him. He left the bottle of sugar pills still open. He'd taken one of them? Yes. And he was dead. You... You mean you no, think... No, no, I called Ed Wilson. He was there in only minutes. It was he who officially said that Tom was dead. Had died instantaneously. And he was sure it was poison. Peculiar color of the lips or something. What do you mean? It was some terrible stimulant to the heart. A very rare drug that only a few researchers would know about. Even the heart of a young and healthy boy would find the influence of this drug too much, too strong. Dr. Wilson told you this? Yes. What is this? Drug? I don't know. Something very rare. But he is sure... That's what did it. Well, what did the police say? You called them in, didn't you? Ed did. They'd never heard of it either, the drug. But they've sent samples of the sugar pills to Chicago and to Washington for analysis. Well? We should hear from them shortly. Where is this Dr. Ed Wilson? Oh, here. I'll, I'll just write you his address. Good, thanks. All right now, Larry. Yes? You told me earlier there was one man you thought might be responsible for this. Who? Walter Marson. Who's Walter Marson? Walter has been Thomas Lamar's personal private secretary for some years. Go on. And Walter has been married to Levon for over a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, because I, I know how you feel about her. Well. Why should that make him want to murder Vonnie's father? Because of Thomas's will. Tom made a will, Johnny, that left virtually everything he owned to the corporation of which he was the head, except for his life insurance. Is that why the amount of his insurance was so big? I suppose so. The sole beneficiary of the policy, as you know, is Vonnie. Oh, well, go on. Go Therefore, on. the only way in which anyone else could share in the estate is by being married to her. All right, all right. You've knocked down a couple of dream castles for me. And I'm not talking about a family fortune. I'm talking about a girl. Yes, John, I understand. If she loved him enough to marry him, let him be happy. If he shares some of that million and a half bucks, so well, let him share it. He deserves to. If she wants him to. He married her, she married him, all right. It isn't as easy as that. What do you mean? You've forgotten you wanted to know why I think Walter Marson murdered Thomas Lamar. Yes. Yes, you see, I happen to know Vonnie did not love Walter. You just said she married him. Unknown to her foster father. What are you getting at? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, Walter Marson, shall we say, got something on Vonnie. What it was, I don't know. But he had a strange power over her, it seemed. Larry, what are you talking about? I don't know, Johnny. From the time Walter first started working for Thomas Lamar, I, well, I didn't trust him. And yet Tom seemed to have the most implicit faith in him. Walter was a good accountant, yes. Handled many of Tom's personal investments. And handled them very well, too. Thomas paid him very well. Rewarded him, always, when he made unusual profits. Why not? But Walter Marson made it plain from the beginning that he wanted to work his way into Thomas's shoes in the corporation. And this Thomas would not have. And the reason? Because Thomas knew that many of the stock deals Walter had made in his behalf were not completely, shall we say, legitimate. Or legally proper, perhaps. But not morally so, that is. Corporation money instead of his own, right? Yeah, that's it. Buying huge blocks in order to inflate the price and then dumping the stocks at their peak, that sort of thing. I don't know much of the details. That's out of my line. But Thomas knew very well that if Walter Marson were ever put into the corporation, he'd use the same slick methods for purely personal gain. At the expense of the corporation, he'd spend his life building up. How do you know about this? I was Thomas's confidant. His closest friend. All right, Larry. Let me do a little summing up. Walter Marson failed to dig into Lamar's money via the corporation. 
So he married his daughter to be sure of latching on to the family fortune. And that's it. Yes, it's as simple as that. Therefore, you're sure this Marson poisoned Lamar. Yes, and because of the findings of Dr. Ed Wilson. Which haven't yet been verified. Well, no. And even if you do find proof that Lamar was poisoned, you have no proof that Marson was back of it. No. Larry, what if Vonnie had something to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's a real possibility, isn't Good it? Good heavens, Johnny, you can't mean that. You, you say you know the girl. Yeah, sure. And I fell for her like a ton of bricks. Whether it's simply because I'm a sucker for such a charmer or just because she charmed me so well, I don't know. But why did she want me if she's already married? Johnny, what are you getting at? A million dollars at stake. A million and a half. How she could possibly have known I'd be staying at the La Crescenta in La Jolla, California, I don't know. But with a million and a half at stake, you could find out most anything. So she worked on me, got me on her side, even before she needed to. And when her father died, according to plan, she knew there'd be no question of settlement of a claim for the insurance because of the way she'd so successfully drawn me into a cozy little noose. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? What are you talking about, you old... (sighs) Yeah, I... I guess I am. John, I've been a confirmed bachelor all my life, even before I was your age. But I know very well that if I'd ever met Vonnie Lamar, my bachelor days would have suddenly ended. Oh, you're hurt. Now that you've found out she's married, you're hurt and you're angry. You're striking out at anything you can reach, anyone. And I'm sorry. Don't let it take away your judgment. I'm... I'm sorry, too, Larry. I... I didn't mean to... I really didn't... It's all right, Johnny. But now get hold of yourself. You have a job to do, not only for me, for the company, but for yourself. Okay, Larry, thanks. Good boy. I... I I don't know what I'm going to do, but... I guess, whatever it is, I... I better start doing it. Yes. Good luck, Jim. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, it doesn't take long to find out what has to be done on this case, because the turning point in the whole thing comes straight to me. And with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.